I will start with uh, CA of the liver, and then we'll move into uh, the uh, biliary tree. Uh, primary um, hepatocellular carcinoma. That's the thing that you're uh, going to see the most. Now, when you scan the liver, most of what you're going to see is a fatty liver. Uh, and, uh, oh, well, look at you. Did you get a couple of amber? There you go. There's no little video of the thing, by the way. It's like a gift, you see. Wouldn't that be the purpose of the diet, Pepsi? No. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, um, little Debbie over cream pies are packed with electrolytes. <laughs> Sodium. <laughs> you guys have seen the movie. I know. Have you guys seen that movie? No, you talked about it. I told you that, right? You need to go see it. All right? You need to go see it. What's it about? It's a snowball. Can you see it? No, that's about the way. It's about down the oh. world over the next 500 years. <laughs> Okay, so hepatocellular carcinoma is the, uh, the big thing that you worry about. Um, then we'll talk about the, uh, the biliary tract. You know, in the U.S., uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is, uh, only makes up a couple of percent of the GI uh, malignancies, 2%. But if you look at the world, it's way up there, and it's way up there because of the high incidence of hepatitis B throughout the world. Um, so, uh, in the underdeveloped com countries there. Uh, treatment here is, uh, you want to try to reset it. If you can. Uh, chemotherapy is another option, but uh, you really want to get that, uh, that disease a little out of there. Um, here's the thing about the Nexavar that I mentioned early on. is part of one of the anti-angiogenesis drugs is that survival with hepatocellular carcinoma, as you see here, uh, if it's metastasized, it's not very good. So the use of Nexavar here is, now this is, this is treatment here, a month of this treatment is going to cost you about $3,000. Uh, so it's not a really expensive drug on the grand scheme of things, but it's not cheap. Um, you're talking about a 10.7 month survival rate versus placebo, 7.9%. So you're going to go $10,000 worth of drug treatment for three months of survival. And that's not going to be the better three months of your life. I promise you that. <clears throat> so, uh, alpha fetal protein is one way to, uh, if you have a uh, uh, hepatocellular uh, carcinoma, you monitor whether or not it's come back by uh, frequent AFPs ultrasounding and um, liver function testing. And by the way, if the patient has hepatitis C, <coughs> hepatitis C, uh, the in incidence of hepat hepatocellular carcinoma is like 5% or so. You monitor them uh, this way. Okay. Ultrasounds, AFPs, and CMDs. Ah, uh, yes. Is that if they have active Hep C or if they've had Hep C and it's not active anymore? If you have um, either, if you have a, a patient with a new diagnosis of hepatitis C and uh, no indication that it's active, you follow it this way. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of benign hep uh, hepatic tumors that you see over here. Um, Fortunately, most of what you're going to encounter is going to be benign, but you're not going to know it's benign on a CT. You're going to have to do a liver biopsy. Uh, and those are usually uh, ultrasound, ultrasound guided liver biopsies. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I may have told you. If you go to uh, Integris, the interventional radiology department, they're the ones that do the ultrasound, the ultrasound guided liver biopsies, and those are all done by PAs, not physicians. Uh, so. um, risk factors for this, well, alcohol. Most of them occur in cirrhotic livers, uh, and most of that's due to uh, alcoholism. Again, you've got hepatitis B and C. A fatty liver uh, is usually a, 
determinant of aging, as you age, it usually, you'll see most of the time it's reported as a fatty liver, mild to moderate uh, degree of fatty liver. You don't need to follow these with AFPs and ultrasounds every six months, only if you have uh, active infections. <coughs> hemochromatosis, we know what obesity is, by the way. Hemochromatosis is a genetic disorder affecting mostly men, and what they do is they'll have a hemoglobin, or let's say a hematocrit of 65, and a hemoglobin of 20. It's an overproduction of red blood cells, and that iron uh, condensates in the liver that produces cirrhosis, so um, that is a risk factor. In an environment, uh, especially uh, arsenic compounds, which is a big deal, and then for those of you on uh, anabolic steroids that are all juiced up, um, Mariah, that's uh, an issue that you have to worry about. Here's the thing that's kind of interesting, um, risk factor for men, uh, risky behaviors because of the IV drug use and the visiting of prostitutes, uh, but if you look at uh, worldwide, uh, Asian folks, uh, up to 75% of people from Vietnam, uh, for example, are uh, hepatitis uh, positive, hepatitis B positive. It's quite high, quite high. So. Um, I've had uh, several friends that were married to people from Vietnam and they didn't even know that their spouse is now, you know, in turn to be uh, uh, hepatitis uh, B positive. It's kind of interesting. So, uh, any questions about that? Uh, now, uh, malignancy of the gallbladder, these things are the biliary tree, including the gallbladder. These are not usually good. Um, the survival here uh, is not very good. And the survival and the not very good happens more frequently than it, it's caught early. Rarely will you pick these up early. Most of the, everyone I've ever seen or every patient I've ever known with a uh, tract, a gallbladder tract tumor, it was not a good outcome. Okay, they did not live long. Now, this can occur in three different places. It can either occur within the bile duct system within the liver or right there at the porta hepatis or the biliary tree itself. And the survival of those, the survivability of those is different depending on where, the, uh, where it occurs. And it probably has to do more with um, being caught early, uh, bowel duct obstruction versus uh, intrahepatic where it's not going to happen. Okay. Um, a hematoma here uh, is a type of tumor that's usually made up of this, uh, it looks like the tissue from where, from which it's arising. It looks like duct tissue of the gall, of the biliary tree, but it's disorganized, and it's not functional. So you can have a hamartoma in any part of your body, and they're benign, just to let you know what they are. Okay? Uh, Hispanic Americans and Native Americans populates, the incidence is uh, the highest in, in those folks. Uh, most here, as it says, are not found until jaundice develops and by obstruction duty. ERCP is something you're, uh, you're probably not going to, uh, you're, you're not going to order. The, uh, the GI person, if you get an upper GI or a CP on somebody, they will make the call on to do an ERCP. And what an ERCP is, is fiberoptic scope, they can actually go into the ampulla of water. They can go into the, the duct system here to biopsy the duct itself. Now, most of the time, what they're going to do is do a, a laparoscopic uh, biopsy, but an ERCP is an easy way, relatively easy way, outpatient way to do uh, biopsy like the head of pancreas or uh, something in the, uh, in the bile duct system. Um, risk factors for um, 
tumors of the duct system here. There are numerous. Again, they're, they're similar to what you're going to see with hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, inflammatory issues, though, um, whether or not they're small bowel, uh, bowel duct, what, anytime you have an inflammatory process going on, like Barrett's esophagus, that's a risk factor. So wherever you see inflammatory process, consider it a risk factor. Uh, sclerosing cholangitis here uh, is going to produce inflammation. Duct stones, inflammation. Caledogocal <coughs> cyst is, a, uh, is sort of an out, it's a diverticulum of the bowel duct system. It's a diverticulum. So uh, that's uh, a risk factor for this problem. And obesity. So obesity is kind of there everywhere. If you look at the survival rate with distance spread, it's way down. Uh, almost non-existent for five years. These things are nasty tumors. Small bowel. Um, there are a whole bunch of types of tumors of the small bowel. Um, adenocarcinoma is really the most uh, common here. Uh, carcinoid we've already been on, and I said, I may have mentioned earlier, that's usually of the uh, ileum. A, a gist tumor here is an interesting thing. It's a benign tumor uh, of the GI tract. It can be either in the stomach or the small bowel. Uh, it's just a, a big nodular tumor that sits there and grows. Uh, you may occasionally run into that. Um, but, the most common thing in the small bowel is going to be an adeno. Uh, one of the specific tumor types that you need to be aware of in the small bowel though is a gastronoma. Gastronoma secrete gastric. Gastrin uh, stimulates the production of HCL from the parietal cells, so you have a high acid content. Uh, and these people wind up with all sorts of uh, ulcerations of the stomach and of the duodenum. High acid content uh, is called Zollinger Allison syndrome. It is produced by a gastrinoma. They're typically benign, except if they arise over towards the pancreas side of things, that's when they have a greater malignancy potential. But generally, they're benign. But if you have somebody coming in with intractable, uh, um, peptic ulcer disease type symptoms and uh, on an EGD you have ulcerations in the, the stomach and in the, in the duodenum. One of the things you get a gastro level is to, to rule out gastronoma. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at the survivability of, of small bowel uh, tumors, once you get again down to stage four, it's single digits. Uh, the risk factors for small bowel, again, go back to uh, inflammation. Uh, Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease mostly involves a small bowel, right? The, the ileum most of the time. Uh, ulcerative colitis involves mostly the colon. can go up into the ileum, but a lot of times Crohn's disease is more small bowel. pooch jagger syndrome is a, uh, it's an inherited uh, polyposis type of condition, as is familial adenomatous polyposis. Familial adenomatous polyposis um, is a, and I think I mentioned this back in anatomy, where you'll have, if you look at the colon in particular, there'll be just thousands of polyps. Uh, the treatment for that is a total colectomy by the time you're a late teenager uh, because of the high malignant potential of these damn little polyps. Okay. And diet. Here we go with the high smoke uh, cured meats uh, in uh, celiac disease. Celiac disease is so what the disorder? What's the cause of celiac disease? Celiac? Gluten. 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 So this is the big popular thing. That everybody has a gluten allergy or insensitivity now. Somebody's making a billion dollars out of gluten free bullshit. Um, so, uh, there was a great article that came out not too long ago about how ridiculous this, this fad was. So eat all the gluten you want. It's like one in 10,000 chance that you actually have a gluten uh, insensitivity. So, they're the same people that do yoga. <laughs> Anybody here got a yoga mat? Let me see. Any yoga mats? 
Latassi, you got a yoga man? Latassi and uh, some of the women up there, they're into yoga now at 4 o'clock. So they probably don't eat gluten either. Okay, so <laughs> you look at small bowel. So here's the tumor. Here's the tumor right there. There's normal tissue on this side, the nasty tumor on that side. So that would be biopsy. As far as the signs and symptoms, they're, uh, they're intuitive. They're intuitive. Now, you're going to run into this um, surgical procedure of the line uh, in reference to uh, proximal bowel, namely the C loop of the duodenum and the, prox and the uh, head of the pancreas area. Uh, this is actually showing a tumor in the head of the pancreas. And what a Whipple does is it removes the head of the pancreas, leaves a little bit of the tail, it removes the duodenum. And if it involves the bowel duct system, it'll remove parts of that as well. But anyway, what you do is you take out all these pieces of parts and you sew them all together, back together. So here's the esophagus, there's the stomach draining directly into the small bowel without going through the duodenum right there. Then they take the piece of pancreas and they suture it into the duodenum. I mean, excuse me, they suture it into the free end of the small bowel so that it drains directly into it. And up here, they re-anastomose the bowel duct into the small the piece of the small bowel. So if you have a localized head of the pancreas or duodenal, proximal duodenum tumor, you'll often hear people talk about a Whipple procedure. If you have a Whipple that works, it's, it's curative. A lot of times you get, they get in there to do a Whipple and they find that the tumor is too invasive and they have to come back out or they do the Whipple and it, they don't do well uh, with it. This is an uh, invasive surgery and these patients are uh, sick for a long time. All right, tumors in the appendix. Um, you know, interestingly, they, they, there are a whole bunch of types and they're not predominant types. You would think the appendix looks almost essentially like a small colon. You know, adenocarcinoma would be the most common thing. Well, in fact, adenocarcinoma only accounts for a small percentage of uh, appendiceal tumors. They come in all these weird, bizarre uh, types. And uh, unfortunately, some of them are malignant. Carcinoid, again, is not, but some of them is, are malignant. The goblet cell adenoma is more aggressive in terms of the malignant potential than even the adenocarcinoma, which you see up there. The prognosis of um, these things, if you catch them early, you've got a near 100% survival. If they grow in size, uh, the survival starts going down. If they start spreading to other parts of the body, though, the five-year survival rate gets down uh, kind of low, okay, which leads us into uh, pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer, um, most of the time, is exocrine-related, and it's duct-related. There are tumors that arise from the endocrine pancreas that I've listed here. Um, all of them have malignant potential. The one that does not have malignant potential, though, is an insulinoma. An insulinoma. So if you have a person that has chronic <coughs> low blood sugar, um, this is one of the things you want to test for. You want to rule out an insulinoma. Uh, but getting back to pancreatic cancer, um, life expectancy, the five-year survival is a single digits. I've never known anybody live with pancreatic cancer uh, over a year. And I've known a lot of people with pancreatic cancer. Um, unfortunately, all of the uh, miracles of modern medicine has made a dent, but has not made a dent in the survivability of uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, this is one of those things, you know, and we talked about it during anatomy, that there, there's so much room around the pancreas, it tends to grow and by the time you find it, it's already metastasized. 
Anybody that comes to your office complaining of uh, peptic ulcer disease, got this funny feeling in my abdomen, won't go away, PPI don't help, HP <coughs> blockers don't help, antacids, out the yin yang, nothing seems to help, drinking goat's milk doesn't help, nothing helps, you better, you better ultrasound. Don't miss this. Everybody I know that wound up with pancreatic cancer had been to the doctor's office a half a dozen times or more before it was found over a period of a long time. So and by then, it's too late. Um, risk factors for pancreatic cancer. Um, w well, we know uh, hypertriglic uh, chronic uh, hypertriglyceridemia uh, produces chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, pan chronic pancreatitis is an inflammatory process that can lead to this malignancy. Chronic pancreatitis. There. Family history. Um, So, any questions about that? Treatment here includes surgery, uh, radiation, and chemo, but um, most of the time it's palliative. And signs and symptoms, in the key words here are painless jaundice. Painless jaundice. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a second year student the other day, and she was telling me that uh, some surgeon she was working with asked her, what, are the, what is the problem with uh, painless jaundice? She said, well, that's pancreatic cancer. He was impressed. So, colon cancer. Colon cancer, uh, boy, it's a lot of cases of these things every year. Um, most colon cancers begin with a non, with a polyp. That polyp undergoes uh, <coughs> malignant change, and then um, you wind up with a cancer later on. There are different types of polyps. Uh, the ones you want are hyperplastic polyps. The ones you don't want are the villous adenomas. Uh, most of them, though, are adenomatous polyps, and they have premalignant potential. Uh, um, the symptoms related to uh, uh, colon cancer are intuitive. We don't need to go over those. If you look at the, uh, what, the, what a polyp looks like, well, that's what a polyp looks like right there. It's obviously a growth on the, on the colon colonic mucosa, and it's the mucosa. You see, that is a submucosa there. It doesn't involve the muscle layer of the colon. It's all epithelial derived. That's why it's a carcinoma. Okay. Uh, if you look at how these things develop, usually they develop like this. They start growing, and as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they become pedunculated. If they're not pedunculated, it's called a sessile polyp versus a pedunculate. So if you get the biopsy back and you're talking about pedunculated polyps, you're talking about a more mature polyp with a little sessile builder. Okay? There's a, a thing called colobar that you can go down to Walgreens and get. What, uh, what they're looking for is the DNA of colon cancer. So you're going to be shedding these cancer cells in your stool. So what, they, what this does is it it's a test of stool for the presence of uh, certain markers, DNA markers, uh, for uh, gene mutations. And that's what, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, <coughs> so. Survival statistics of colon cancer. I've known several people to die of colon cancer. It's amazing it's just how frequent it is. It's crazy how frequent it is. If you catch it early, it's a very good rate. A friend of mine was a, a, a gynoc, a gynecology oncologist. He, I mean, he dealt with cancer all the time. He was probably, uh, his daughter went to school with my daughter. Uh, he was a um, smart guy, really smart guy crazy smart guy, winds up with uh, stage 4 colon cancer, dead in two years. Uh, just crazy, crazy. And he was probably in his um, about 50 when he died. So. Another friend of mine is a PA in the state. He had an identical twin brother. Identical twin brother. You know what that means, don't you? Same genetics. His identical twin brother is dead at the age of 28 of colon cancer. How do you think that makes him, Matt, Matt feel? Matt, he will be lecturing to you later on. So, anyway. Um, 
anal cancer. Anal cancer, Farrah Fawcett. Uh, can't believe Farrah Fawcett died of anal If you know Farrah Fawcett, probably you know, like from the 1920s, silent movie. And that was, um, most of these are squamous cell because uh, the anus is it's not until you get a couple of inches up does it become uh, adenomatous uh, tissue, but most of these are squamous cell. Um, most of these are uh, HPV related now. So risk factors and anal warts uh, would be uh, one of the presence of uh, genital warts or anal warts. Uh, any type of uh, immune dysfunction, um, obviously multiple partners smoking. I've seen some of the worst cases of anal warts in high school kids. Uh, they're just uh, just crazy. And you know they're at a they're at a high risk now for developing anal cancer in the next 10, 15 years. It's just crazy. So uh, most common. Uh, more common among women, but even more common among uh, African American uh, men for some for some reason. Uh, if you look at the survival rates for anal cancer, they get down here to where it's metastasized. Again, single digits, not good. I think that's it. Oh, so let me explain this picture. Any questions about this? So back when, I was a, back when I was a student, this is, just put your pen down, turn that thing off. <laughs> <laughs>